Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us by visiting their final resting places. Today we're exploring Home of Peace Cemetery, where we'll find two stooges, Shemp and Curly, and the founders of three major Hollywood studios. Join us, won't you? Home of Peace is a Jewish cemetery located in East LA, right across the street from Calvary Cemetery, which we visited in our previous tour. It's the oldest Jewish cemetery in the area, and like the old Calvary Cemetery, the first Jewish cemetery was located closer to what is now Dodger Stadium in Chavez Ravine in the mid-1800s. When that site filled to capacity, Home of Peace was established in East LA, and between 1902 and 1910, using horse-drawn wagons, the community members worked tirelessly to relocate their honored ancestors to their new resting places. At the heart of the cemetery is the Home of Peace Mausoleum and Chapel, dedicated in 1934. It's an architectural treasure in LA, intricately and ornately designed, with echoes of old world synagogues. We'll begin our tour just in from the entrance in Section A. Right near the road is Mark Sandrich. He was a director in the 30s and 40s, notable for having directed Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers in many of their successful musical films, including The Gay Divorcee, Top Hat, and Shall We Dance. He also directed Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire in the classic Holiday Inn, which introduced the world to Irving Berlin's timeless holiday song, White Christmas. He died suddenly of a heart attack at just 44. Continuing up to section 3M on the right, just before a hedge is Jack Skirball. He served as an ordained rabbi in the 20s before making his way to Hollywood where he would produce films, including a number of Alfred Hitchcock films. He was also a philanthropist, founding the Hebrew Union College Skirball Museum, later renamed the Skirball Cultural Center which sought to show that Christians and Jews have much in common and to dissipate anti-Semitism. The Skirball Center for the Performing Arts in New York is named in his honor. Are you a fan of Warner Brothers? Well, three of the four brothers are right here at Home of Peace. Youngest brother, Jack Warner, was co-founder of Warner Brothers Studios with brothers Harry, Sam, and Albert. In the very early years, the enterprising brothers made money showcasing films across Ohio and Pennsylvania. Young Jack would sing and entertain the audiences during real changes. In 1910, the brothers sold the business, pooled their resources, and by the teens were producing their own films. Their first hit came in 1918 with My Four Years in Germany. The success of this film allowed the brothers to establish a studio in California. Jack became co-head of production with brother Sam. In 1923, a German shepherd named Rin Tin Tin would become their first big star. But even with these successes, Warner struggled to compete with the big three of the era, Paramount, Universal, and First National. And then came sound. In 1927, Warner's released the first feature-length talkie, The Jazz Singer, turning around the studio's fortunes and making it one of the major players in Hollywood, which it remains to this day. For the next few decades, Jack remained head of production at Warner Brothers, and was known to rule with an iron fist. His relationship with his brother soured in later years. In one notoriously devious move, in 1956, the three surviving brothers agreed to sell most of their shares in the company. But Jack kept his instead, and organized a syndicate to purchase back the shares for control of the company. Jack then became the company's largest stockholder, and he appointed himself president. His brothers were furious, and they never spoke again. That may be the reason why we have to travel across the cemetery to find the rest of the Warners. Straight east in Section D is a small Warner mausoleum. Here we find Sam Warner, the brother who started it all. In the early 1900s he began working as a movie projectionist and saw the potential for the new medium. He convinced Albert and Harry to join him in showing films in carnivals in Ohio and Pennsylvania, then they purchased their own theater in 1905. By the teens, the Warners were making their own films, and when Warner Brothers Incorporated in 1923, Sam became the company's CEO. Ever the visionary, Sam sought to sync sound with film, and pushed for a partnership with Western Electric to do just so. Their first feature experiment was Don Juan in 1926, which was the first film to utilize the Vitaphone Sound on Disc system, 
which synchronized sound and music, but no dialogue. Despite this, the studio was on the brink of financial ruin, and Sam pushed hard for a moonshot. And the jazz singer was produced, becoming a smash hit, and ushering in the talkie revolution. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Sadly, Sam would never live to see the fruits of his efforts, dying one day before the premiere of The Jazz Singer. The Warner parents and several other siblings are also entombed in this mausoleum. Around the corner is another Warner mausoleum, where eldest brother Harry is entombed. In 1905, Harry sold his bicycle shop to join Sam and Albert in the family's fledgling film business. It was Harry's business savvy that helped the Warners grow their company and he would serve as president of Warner Brothers from 1923 to 1956. Harry was a businessman, but not so much a visionary, and actually fought hard against talking pictures, saying, quote, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? But it was talkies like the jazz singer and Lights of New York that would eventually save the company. Now flush with cash, the Warners moved their studio to Burbank in the late 20s, where it stands to this day. Harry died from a stroke in 1958, but after Jack's double dealings, those close to him believed he died of a broken heart. His wife going so far to say that he didn't die, Jack killed him. In this same mausoleum is Charles Vidor, son-in-law of Harry and a film director. He found his greatest successes in the 40s and 50s with films like Gilda, featuring Rita Hayworth, and a Chopin biopic, A Song to Remember. The fourth Warner brother, Albert, is buried in New York. Let's make our way now to the mausoleum. The first corridor on the right is the Corridor of Love. All the way at the end on the right is the Lemley family room. One of the most influential men to shape early Hollywood was Universal Studios founder Carl Lemley. Born in Germany, Lemley emigrated to the US when he was 17 to seek his fortunes. He discovered the Nickelodeons in 1906, which were the first exhibition spaces to show projected motion pictures, charging a nickel for admission. Lemley was hooked and jumped right into the business, quickly becoming one of the major players in the film exchange. When Thomas Edison formed the Edison Trust in 1908, charging exorbitant fees to all distributors and exerting a monopolistic control over the industry, Lemley responded by independently producing his own pictures, forming the Independent Moving Picture Company in 1909. In partnership with other filmmakers, including David Horsley, Universal was formed in 1912, and would become Hollywood's oldest and longest running major motion picture studio. Much of what we associate with Hollywood came from the mind of Lemley. He invented the star system, being the first to use a star's name in a film's marketing. He pioneered the large studio lot, building Universal City, which really did amount to a small city in the San Fernando Valley, a one-stop shop where all aspects of production could take place and he was the first to offer studio tours, allowing the general public to watch movies be made. He was a true showman, and unlike some other studio bosses of the age, Lemley was a good-natured man beloved by those who knew and worked with him. Some of the legendary films produced under Lemley include The Hunchback of Notre Dame, The Phantom of the Opera, and The Man Who Laughs. Lemley's son, Carl Lemley Jr., was groomed from a young age to take over the business, having basically spent his entire upbringing in the movies. And so, on his 21st birthday, Junior was named head of production at Universal. One of his first films was All Quiet on the Western Front, winning Universal their first Oscar. Junior is perhaps best known, however, for his role in producing Universal's monster movies of the 30s. Lemley Sr.'s monster movies of the 20s were more Beauty and the Beast type tales than full horror. Junior, inspired by German Expressionism, wanted to take Hollywood horror to the next level. Lemley Sr. was reticent at first, but Jr. saw the potential, and gave us classics like Dracula, Frankenstein, The Bride of Frankenstein, The Mummy, and more. Films which have come to identify Universal. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! But after years of overspending, including on the 1936 movie Showboat, both Lemleys were essentially forced out of the company in a hostile takeover. In the 30s, during the rise of the Nazi party in Germany, the Lemleys worked hard to sponsor Jews from their home in Germany, to bring them to the US and save them from the Holocaust. 
and family was very important to the Lemleys. This beautiful painting is of Carl's great-granddaughter, Laura Lee, who tragically died as a teenager in a car accident and is entombed here as well. Let's make our way back toward the chapel. Then take the corridor of memory on the left. Then right and right again at the corridor of harmony. Low on the wall of niches is Don Hartman. He was a writer, producer, and director of films in the 30s to the 50s. He was nominated for two Oscars in his career for his screenplays for Road to Morocco and The Gay Deception. He also wrote lyrics for many of the songs featured in his films. Continuing down this corridor, then left, we find the Corridor of Eternal Life on the right. In a few spaces on the right is Shemp Howard. Shemp was elder brother to Moe and Curly Howard, and was one of the original lineup of Ted Healy and his Stooges, later the Three Stooges. Shemp joined his brother Moe and Ted Healy on stage during an impromptu performance in the early 20s, and then became a part of the group. Larry Fine joined the lineup in 1925. They can all be seen together in 1930's Soup to Nuts. After a disagreement with Healy, Shemp left the Stooges and was replaced by younger brother Curly. Shemp went on to a successful solo career where, as a publicity stunt, he once branded himself the ugliest man in Hollywood. When Curly's failing health forced him to quit the group in the mid-40s, Shemp rejoined the Stooges and remained with them until his death. Gee, Mo, I'm sorry, Mo. What Mo can a fella say? That's all there is. There ain't no Mo. <laughs> You're only nervous. You were just careless. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Shemp died suddenly in 1955. He was in the back seat of a taxi with friend Al Winston. He was laughing and had just lit up a cigar when he suddenly slumped over into Al's lap. At first Al thought it was a joke, but soon realized that he had died of what is believed to have been a massive heart attack. Near the end of this corridor, on the left, we find funny man Harry Einstein, also known as Parkyacarcus. He rose to fame on radio alongside stars like Eddie Cantor and Al Jolson. His success as Park Yukarkis led to his own radio show in 1945. Later in his career he frequently made appearances in Friars Club roasts. It was at the roast honoring Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz in 1958 that he suffered a fatal heart attack on stage. After his routine he sat down next to Milton Berle, then appeared to just faint onto Berle's lap. Physicians attended to him, but were unable to save him. To distract the stunned audience, Burl turned to Tony Martin and asked him to sing a song. His unfortunate song choice, There's No Tomorrow. Next to Harry is the unmarked crypt of his wife, Thelma Leeds. She starred alongside her husband in New Faces of 1937, and can also be seen in The Toast of New York. She retired from show business after her marriage to Harry Einstein. They're the parents of actor and filmmaker Albert Brooks. Let's head back the way we came. Whoa, slow it down so we can enjoy this beautiful mausoleum. Across the chapel is the Corridor of Devotion. We turn left, then all the way at the end is the Corridor of Immortality. At the end of this corridor, on the left wall, is the co-founder of another major Hollywood studio, Louis B. Mayer. He is the mayor in Metro Goldwyn Mayer, MGM. In the early 1900s he began to open theaters across New England to showcase moving pictures, including the exclusive rights to the 1915 mega-hit The Birth of a Nation. Years later, like so many others, he landed in LA and started his own production company. In 1924 he partnered with Samuel Goldwyn's Goldwyn Pictures and Marcus Lowe's Metro Pictures, forming Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Under his leadership, MGM became the most prestigious film studio, and Mayer had a knack for developing star actors. Many of Hollywood's biggest names, like Hedy Lamarr, Judy Garland, Clark Gable, Greta Garbo, Joan Crawford, and Norma Shear, all came out of MGM. And at its peak in the 30s, Mayer was the highest paid executive in America. He resigned from MGM in 1951. Just below Mayer is music director Leo Forbstein. His career began in Missouri, where he became principal conductor at the Newman Theater in Kansas City, pioneering the synchronization of live orchestral music to silent film, with organist and future Hollywood composer Carl Stalling. He landed in Hollywood in the 20s where he headed the symphony at Grauman's Egyptian Theater. He eventually landed at Warner Brothers where he would work with composers like Eric Wolfgang Korngold 
and Max Steiner on films like Captain Blood, The Adventures of Robin Hood, and Casablanca. He died of a heart attack while preparing music for the 1948 Academy Awards. Down this corridor, high on the right wall, is songwriter and lyricist Mac Gordon. He was nominated for a Best Song Oscar nine times, winning with Harry Warren for their song, You'll Never Know. Other of his well-known songs include Chattanooga Choo Choo and At Last, performed perhaps most memorably by Etta James. At last. That'll do it for the mausoleum. Let's head out back to the southwest section of the cemetery. From the second road west of the mausoleum, count five rows in and turn left. Here is the most visited grave in the cemetery, and one of Hollywood's most beloved comedians, Jerome Curley Howard. He was the youngest of the Howard brothers, and after Shemp left the Stooges, Moe suggested Jerome fill in the role. But Healy felt that Jerome, then with long curly hair and a mustache, didn't look funny. So he left the room and came back with a shaved head, was given the nickname Curly, and joined the group. In 1934, the Three Stooges signed with Columbia, and quickly became the most popular short subject attraction, thanks in large part to Curly, whose energetic, childlike persona made him a hit with audiences, particularly children. His seemingly endless arsenal of animated mannerisms and vocalisms would become legendary in the world of comedy. You remind me of the Three Stooges. Hey! That's an insult! In 1946, while filming Halfwit's Holiday, Curly suffered a massive stroke and was forced to retire from the group. He had hoped to return one day, but health problems continued to plague him until his death in 1952 at the age of 48. In a million years, there will never be another like Curly. Fans have even left memory stones spelling out his iconic laugh. Back to the road, let's make our way around to the east side of the cemetery, to Edition 1 on the right. Just in from the road is Conrad Wells, birth name Abraham Fried. He was a cinematographer in early Hollywood, specializing in outdoor and western cinematography, for films like The Skyhawk. His life was tragically cut short at the age of 30 while filming scenes for the 1930 film Such Men Are Dangerous. During aerial shooting off the coast of California near Santa Monica, two camera planes collided, bursting into flames and crashing into the ocean. All ten men aboard were killed, including Wells, and the film's director Kenneth Hawks, the brother of Howard Hawks. North along this same row we find Carla Lemley. She was an actress and the niece of Carl Lemley. Her first role was in her uncle's 1925 film The Phantom of the Opera. She also had a small role in Dracula, delivering the opening lines in the movie. Among the rugged peaks that frown down upon the Borgo Pass are found crumbling castles of a bygone age. I say driver, a bit slower. She continued in small roles through the 30s when she disappeared from the screen until 60 years later, when she returned to play a vampire in 2001's The Vampire Hunters Club. At the time of her death in 2014 at the age of 104, she was believed to be the last surviving vestige of the silent era. And while her film roles may have been few, she may have had the longest film career in Hollywood history, lasting from 1925 to 2014. Farther north along this road is Half Block on the right. Several rows in we find Carmel Myers. She was an actress who found her greatest success in the silent era. She played the Egyptian vamp Iris in 1925's Ben-Hur, alongside Ramon Navarro and Francis X. Bushman. The success of this film led to roles in The Devil's Circus and Tell It to the Marines. She made the transition into the talkies with films like Svengali. Lechaim means to life. Finally, we head northeast to plot 12 in this same block, where Ruth Harriet Louise is buried. She was a portrait photographer for MGM in early Hollywood. 
1925, at the age of 22, she was the first and only woman in Hollywood studios working as a portrait photographer. Over the next five years, she would capture some of Hollywood's biggest stars, including Greta Garbo, John Gilbert, Joan Crawford, Marion Davies, and more. She is believed to have captured some 100,000 images in her tenure there, and is considered one of the great glamour photographers of the era. She was the sister of Mark Sandrich, and the cousin of Carmel Myers. She died at the age of 37 from complications of childbirth. Her tombstone depicts Ruth, her six-year-old son Lee Jr., who died of leukemia, and her premature son, who died in childbirth just before her. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching, we'll see you on the next one. We found the Warner Brothers. No sign of the Warner sister, though. Come join the Warner Brothers and the Warner sister dot. Just for fun, we run around the Warner movie lot. They lock us in the tower whenever we get caught. But we break loose and they're the moose, and now you know the plot.